Okay, uh, thanks everyone for coming to today's uh, CITP Lunchtime Seminar. Uh, today we're very fortunate to have Professor Wenke Lee, who is a professor of computer science at the College of Computing at Georgia Tech. Wenke's also the co-director of the Information Security and Privacy Center there. Um, his research um, uh, is quite a long list of topics. Uh, he has uh, worked on uh, intrusion detection back to his days uh, as, a, as a student at Columbia. After that, he um, sort of parlayed that into a lot of work on botnet monitoring and detection and later founded Dumbala, uh, which is a, a botnet uh, detection company based out of Atlanta. Um, and uh, he's also worked on a number of topics, including uh, virtual machine monitoring, malware analysis, uh, and so forth. And um, he and I together also worked on a number of topics, including things like information manipulation, censorship, uh, uh, web profile pollution, and, and the like. And today, Winky is going to talk to us about uh, protecting uh, user data in cloud-hosted services. Thanks. Thank you, Nick. Yeah. Um, so I'm glad to be here. So today, I'm going to talk about uh, how do you uh, how do we protect uh, user data? Um, so I think in the um, old days, um, we think about attacks as uh, targeting some of the um, services or, or websites. And we think about, oh, this website has been defaced. And we think about the damage will be associated with their software and hardware. But you know, more recently, I think we should realize that the attackers, they are not going after the software or the or even the hardware damages. Because I mean those things are pretty cheap, right? You can actually replace them very easily. I mean, think about if you are in an enterprise network, if your machine is compromised, they can basically take it away and then give you a new one, or they can re-image your machine within an hour. So um, and even without the uh, attack, I mean, think about how often we replace our uh, machines, right? So, so these are not the real targets. The real target is really the data. I right? think about all the uh, recent uh, highlights that you um, you read from the from the news media, including Sony and the Office of Personnel Management and Target and so on. And even something that I don't list here, I've heard rumors saying that you know some hackers came in and installed the whole de the design of a whole airplane, things like that. So, I mean, the first reaction I always had is like, whoa. How could they steal so much data? It's like having a truck drive through your house. I mean, how could you not know? Uh, <laughs> that's my first reaction. And then, and then you think about it more to say, I mean, how, how are you going to prevent this, right? So you talk to the office OPM people. They say, well, you know, our, our agency is, is supposed to serve the needs for, paper, uh, for people who actually want to verify or uh, look at the background of the, of the personnel. And obviously, they need to access our data, right? So, so then. You think about the security protection, really it means that you know, to secure data access, you want to make sure that uh, the access is by uh, authenticated users and the access itself is authorized based on the uh, access control policy, right? So in terms of authentication, people do this all the time, right? You use password. But really, you know, with malware and bots, it doesn't really matter, right? So if your machine has been compromised, they can just wait until you log in and then just use your connection, right? Or they can just key out your password and then just go from there. So really, I, I think the, the key to uh, secure data access is to how do you know that the action of data access is, is actually by the real, real user, not the bot or malware that actually is able to you know, uh, reuse the uh, user's um, credential. So that's really where I... I came from, and in fact, uh, Nick mentioned about our work in botnets. And many years ago, we were th thinking aloud to ourselves, that how do I distinguish any traffic that's initiated by bot versus human? Right. So this is actually related. So, so you say, OK, now if you want to protect data, you know, the first question you want to ask yourself is, uh, OK, there's so much data is, uh, is being uh, accessed in your network or on your computer. Um, how do you know which one is really important? You say, let's ask the user. I mean, I'm not going to even try that route. Maybe we know that users, they don't want the security people to be close to them, right? They say, hey, just secure my thing, go away, don't bother me with any questions. So uh, at least that's my understanding of uh, usability or 
uh, use attitudes towards security. So I try to always bypass them to say, can I make security transparent so that, so that they don't have to think about it? Uh, it just happens, okay? So, um, so our solution is try to monitor their interaction with the application and infer what their intentions really are and then and then based on that, we can figure out what data they actually want or meant to um, meant the data to be protected. So we start with this observation. So think about how you, how you interact with applications such as uh, a Word editor or even email, right? You, you type in, you know, type letter A you know, through a keyboard and then you see on the screen, you say, okay, ah, the application gets my letter. I guess my data. And at some point, you finish composing your, your message is hit send. Yes, that's how we typically, or you say save, whatever, right? So actually, my point is that this is a feedback loop in the sense that if, if the application gets it wrong, it means the application by default is supposed to display you know, your input on its output to say, hey, I get it. I display it back to you. And if it gets wrong, you would, the user would just try to correct it. So the point is that this example shows, simple example shows you that um, seems to me there's a policy that we can kind of infer that with a lot of text-based applications such as word editing and email, there's a policy that you don't have to ask the user. This, this policy is what you see is what you send, or what you see is what you save, right? You, you, you author it and you say save. Well, you, Obviously, you meant the application to send this out or save it. And so that's a policy uh, that I think most users will agree. And, uh, and we say, OK, well, let's see whether we can actually enforce this policy just by default without bothering the, the user. OK. Um, so, so here's an example, right? So you say, OK, what you see is what you said is not quite right. Anybody who's actually doing some networking work, systems work, would know that you know, from what you see on the screen so to what you see on the outgoing uh, payload uh, would be some little bit different, all this encoding and, and formatting. But the point is, you can actually figure this out, right? So you know, the, the space is encoded in a certain way. And you know, maybe even there's some application metadata. But, but you should be able to still draw the one-to-one -one correspondence between what the user sees on screen versus uh, what's being sent in the payload, right? And uh, so the goal is, can we enforce it? So you think about it, how do we do this? We say, okay, all I do is simple, right? I build a security monitor. The security monitor will just compare the outgoing traffic data with the data on the screen, in the, on the GUI, right? So that, that's a high level uh, things that uh, uh, monitor, security monitor should do. But the question is, how does the security monitor get the data from the GUI? So the, obviously, the security monitor uh, would be, by default, would be outside of the application because you know the third model um, would be that the application itself can be compromised, right? So you say, I put a security monitor in the OS. Well, the OS only knows bits, bitmaps does have enough um, application semantic to know what data is on a GUI means what. So essentially, you actually have to query the application, say, hey, what's on the message buffer? Tell me that. Right? So, but if that's what the security monitor is doing, then if the application is compromised, it can slide to the monitor to say, oh, although user see A, when you query the, the application, the application say, hey, the GUI actually says B and will match the modified content sent out, right? So, the, so the point is that in order for us to, to securely matching what the user actually sees on the screen with the output uh, data, you, we actually have to be able to uh, control the GUI so that we know, we know exactly what's being on display matches what the user is seeing in his eyes. So we, we I mean, this project has a long history. I mean, actually, one PhD student, he, he gave up. He was, was long history, and then he graduated, and then next student came on board. He's, he was fresh and new. I said, I'll try this. He, you know, because it's new, he said, oh, yeah, sure, I'm going to try it. And then, long story short, eventually got it working. <laughs> so it's a, it's a simple idea. It's actually trying to get it work. It's not uh, easy. So eventually, we, we settled in this uh, mechanism that is now, I think, 
works pretty well. So the observation here is that in order to securely control the display, um, what we can see, oh, the previous version is that we actually do an do a image map from the OS and then do OCR. You can think about that, but it's, yeah, tough. Yeah, I mean, but, but that's, that's one, one secure way of doing it, right? But then, but then figure that's actually is kind of expensive, slow, and not really accurate. And so we come up with this idea called security overlay. And this overlay actually is a separate window controlled by security monitor. It can be in the OS, can be in your virtual machine monitor. The point is that this is completely separate, separated from the application, right? And, uh, and we, so some part, so basically it, it's, it's, a, it's a whole GUI window that's the same as the original application GUI window, except that a lot of parts are basically transparent, meaning that we don't draw, we're just transparent. And only certain f elements, we actually redraw them, such as a text box. Okay, so we basically control the contents that's, that are most important to the user, such as the message window. We make sure that what's being displayed to the user, because we, we can control that this is on the top. So user will see what we draw on the window, right? If the user don't agree, they would attempt to edit, right? Um, and then, and then because we control the the GUI, uh, the our security overlay, and we know exactly the contents the user is seeing, then we can actually match the network output. Okay, so that's that's how we can enforce what you see, what you see. Yeah, the gateway is compromised or the machine is compromised. We uh, so the, so our threat model depending on the architecture. Uh, varies, but we always assume that the application can be compromised, or the uh, app, there will be user land malware. What I mean there, so there is one application that's compromised. I mean, if the machine is compromised, so when you, when you say machine compromised, what do you mean? Do you I mean, mean like the OS? It, yes, some, I mean something is controlling this interface. Right, is a thing that you are proposing. Yeah, absolutely. So, so let's say if you don't have virtual machine monitor architecture. Then you, you can put this on the in the OS in the in the kernel. So you have the OS kernel control the security monitor. Then you have to assume the OS kernel is not compromised. Right, as simple as that. Basically, you have to have trusting computing base. It is OS kernel or the security or the virtual machine monitor, and your assumption has to be you're trusting because it's called trusted computing base. That cannot be compromised. If that's compromised, then game over. Right, and then the point is that you have the trusted computing base to control the security monitor. So typically, that means at least it should be in a, in a kernel. If you have virtual machine monitor, you should put it in a virtual. You have to put it into a security uh, a VM controlled by the security monitor. All right. Any other question? Okay. So, um, so like I said, basically it, it just it just redraws ele elements that are important. Let's say it's such an edit box, and it's actually a passive UI, meaning that it does actually get the application input. It actually just I intercept it through the um, through the hardware interface and then just destroy it. We, we in, in a sense that we don't actually filter from the application. The application still gets the input, but we just rejoin it. Okay, um, and uh, it actually supports most of the UI interactions. So your question can be: Okay, how do you know um, how to actually draw this overlay? That seems to be harder than the OCR, right? So <laughs> it turns out that there's a, most of the operating systems, including your Android and uh, iOS, the yeah, iOS is kind of more close, but most of the modern operating systems, they have this so-called UI automation library. And so this was uh, mandated by some kind of federal regulations because uh, if you have uh, any d disabilities, for example, you cannot, you cannot see Right? Then you want the application GUI to actually be able to, to uh, export this GUI elements, and then there will be help application that can actually, you know, uh, do audio. Uh, tell, tells you the layout of the, of the application. Right? So the so point is that in order for people who are disabled to be able to use the application, the application actually they have to export their UI elements, not just the layout, but also the what each element means and what the actions associated with each element. And this actually is, you can actually query this information through the UI automation library. 
Okay. So uh, any so most of the applica applications that we know about, let's say Word or browser, they actually they actually export this information, and you can actually query it through the UI automation library that the OS uh, provides. For example, we can say that so for example, this is the UI tree that you can actually get through UI automation library. It will tell you, hey, here's the button, right? When you hit the button, that means it sends the content and so on. Right? Here's the here's the two field and and so on. So you actually can get all of this information for any any uh, application that has the GUI. So that that's our trick to basically be able to analyze application GUI and figure out which fields are important and then be able to draw them exactly the way the GUI is supposed to look. And then in terms of the system uh, architecture for, in particular for security, we put a UI monitor on the guest VM. So this is a kind of a, the most secure kind of architecture, right? Of course, downside is that a lot of people don't want to use, don't want to use uh, virtual machine architecture. So that's a trade-off between usability and uh, security. But this is the kind of most secure uh, configuration that you run a security, uh, you run a virtual machine monitor, right? Then you run different virtual machines. And let's say your guest virtual machine is your typical productivity virtual machine, such as the one that you run your Windows or Linux and your, your Word uh, application. And then we have, a, we have a UI monitor that actually uh, monitors the application and, and uh, query the UI elements uh, on the GUI. And then it, it actually talks to the security VM and in particular talks to the uh, security overlay um, monitor so that you can actually know how what to draw, right? And and now imagine if the user types in some input through the keyboard, it will first trap because it's a hardware event, right? So the lowest layer gets it first, right? So we so through the uh, virtual machine monitor, uh, it will get to get to the security VM first, and then um, and then and then. Um, our, our controller would actually let the um, uh, application UI to draw, and then in the meantime, we also tells our security overlay to actually draw on top, right? Um, and then let's say when the when the user um, um, hits the send button, right? Our security um, monitor will basically take the contents in our security. Uh, overlay because, like I said, uh, overlay, uh, any of the overlay UI would tell you that you have these elements and you have this value in this text field, right? So when 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 the when the user hits the button, we actually, we, of course, we can intercept that button and then tell the UI say, hey, the user now intends to send this data, and the data will be captured uh, from the security overlay, and then we put into a database and say, okay, now the user actually wants to send this information. That's from the GUI action. And then when, it, when the data actually hits the network going out, again, we can intercept that, right? And we can actually then, we can verify, hey, the outgoing payload data that we, that we can extract from our, our kind of a proxy uh, we install on the security monitor. Uh, basically, we have a network proxy that takes the payload and then compare with what's stored in the, in the database. So that way, even if the user working offline, they hit send, okay, we just store it, right? And then later on, when the network, network connection happens, we can still match the content. So that's the general architecture in the, in the workflow. Any question? Yeah? So, uh, considering, let's say, an attacker. So yeah. attacker are using uh, keyloggers. Yeah. <coughs> so would you... I mean, if you would uh, consult the uh, attacker, so uh, would you tell them that they should use uh, this kind of uh, interface because it seems to be like more robust than a uh, keyboard. I'm, I, I was about to suggest you to use a keylogger to capture all keystrokes, but uh, this one so seems uh, like a more generic uh, API. So the keylogger is obviously very general purpose. It just logs every single key, right? But it doesn't know the application context. It doesn't know that you're typing in the message box. So you basically have to still interpret. You, so you record a bunch of keystrokes. You then you have to, knowing the application context, you try to interpret. Oh, this means he's, he's typing this message, right? Whereas through all this you, GUI and UI knowledge, we know exactly 
what data we should capture, what data matters that we should compare. Even if the, the attacker knows the, the context, like the name of the right. window that clicked in the window system. So is there, are there any more advantages for uh, this uh, API, or, or this is the main advantage that you know the context, uh, which is great. Uh, yeah. So I mean, I th I think I think knowing the context is probably the main advantage. I mean, again, intuitively, it's like I said, what you see is what you send, right? And then I think one other thing about the um, the key logging, the the limitation is that it doesn't, for example, do the copy paste. We can do copy paste, right? So if suppose you copy something from a Word document and paste on the screen. We can actually capture that. We capture the copy content. Whereas if you do key logging, you will not be actually know what you have copied. So you would say that like the next generation for attackers, instead of key loggers, they would use this kind of uh, system. It sounds more uh, efficient. Uh, I mean. They could. I mean, I guess, I suppose. Um, yeah. <coughs> yeah. I mean, a, a, any any tool <laughs> we we build, we build tools. Yeah. I mean, any tool can be abused. Yes. So I, so sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. So I had a general question. So the general purpose of this mechanism that you're proposing is that some somebody is writing something in the computer, and we just want to make sure the payload is uh, what he wrote. Yeah. So, so basically, again, it's what you see is what you send. Suppose you, you have, uh, I mean, one, one uh, easiest analogy would be suppose you have your machine is infected, right, by a piece of malware, and the malware sends some spam. Okay, so and and th this would stop it and say, hey, there wasn't a user typing the message. So the point, I mean, I, so for this idea, so you're somehow using the image processing, I guess. The, what, the, what? the image processing? Uh, not, no. I mean, the okay. original idea, like OCR image processing, we kind of ditched that. So this one, we don't have to use uh, OCR because because you can actually walk the, like I said, you can walk the UI, you can walk the UI tree, and you know exactly the contents that's being associated with that element. We can okay, just extract like, so it from the memory. I mean, as he mentioned, so there is like these key loggers that are doing something like this similar. Yeah. And there is like, I mean, <coughs> we can also read the clipboard. Like, what do we have in the clipboard? So what we copy. You could. Yeah. And we can also see that okay, if there is a control Z. Uh, there is a control V, which means that the user is pasted. Something. Yeah, could be. Yeah. Um, and the context could be, I mean, like, we can look at, I mean, looking yeah, I mean, actually which is the latest window the user is looking at, then you can assume that that's the context, I guess. Uh, it could be, but the thing is that how do you know exactly where I copy in? Suppose I also use. Yeah, but I mean, there is only one single window which is on top of the others. I know, but, but suppose I use my arrow key to move around and then I copy exactly here. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to do that in the so you, key logger? You know which program is on top? Don't you I know, but, but, but let's say I'm typing, right? At some point I want to copy and paste, oh, okay. right? I move my mouse or move my something, I can copy exactly in, in this place. I mean, sure, you can. I mean, look, you can you can use low-level programming to do anything you want, but but this is more direct, I would say. Okay, but it's also more intrusive, right? You have to install a plugin of some sort. It's not that you, and you can actually do it for every every application. Well, I mean, if you use Keylogger and do the things that you guys do, actually, it's also pretty intrusive as well. It's also intrusive. I mean, uh, this. Yeah. No, so so point of following, right? So I would argue that this actually is not intrusive, in a sense that, look, this. We're going to show you some demo uh, uh, on, 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 on screen. The point here is that if you look at the, oh, sorry, sorry about the confusion about my direction. But, but the point is that this window lays on top of the application window. And when you interact with the application, you don't know, even know that this overlay is actually taking place. Right? So if, if you look at the architecture, it sounds intrusive. But, but, that, but does the user really care about that? I mean, all it cares about is the inter interaction with the application. It doesn't care how many hundreds of million lines of code under, underneath. They don't. That's my, my argument. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, so like, the general system seems to be fairly um, application agnostic. Like, you're using UI yeah. automation data, so you don't yeah. really need to know a lot about the application. Um, but on the actual network sending packet side, yeah. uh, most applications send out a fairly enormous amount of metadata. Yeah. <laughs> 
which you don't ever really see on screen. <coughs> so how do right. you kind of verify what's metadata that's allowed and what's kind of both malware and producer? Yeah, data? yeah. So so that's uh, let me skip the fair amount of this uh, obvious stuff. So we do need to talk about. Uh, we do have to have the application specific logic, right? So I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, the general, I mean, it's easier said than done. Okay, it's very general, but in fact, we actually have to look at each application and figure out that we actually get the GUI elements right and also know exactly how to process the metadata and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, so again, long history of this work is that it got stuck in the queue of many conferences for a long time. It eventually, got published. And we have every time to tune down, tune down our claim. But, but I was I was still sort of say that at the end of the day, um, we actually get it working with a variety of applications that were very representative, right? So we got it working with various uh, you know email um, clients, you know, including uh, Outlook and uh, and uh, Gmail and PayPal and so on. And so the point is that if you think about um, the amount of work that we do every day, I would say 80% of them deals with just text, texting. Various kind of texting. Right? And the metadata actually is pretty straightforward. Right? So my point is, hey, if I can pr protect 80% of the data that you deal with every day, I think that's a win. So that's, I mean, it's not, I mean, for example, right, one thing that really can trip us easily would be uh, something like uh, Excel uh, program, Microsoft. Um, Excel, because really, if you think about it, what we're doing is is looking at applications that does very simple for reformatting or repackaging of the input data to the to the output. Meaning, the processing is actually very straightforward. Uh, whereas, if the application does some Turing complete processing of data, then we're just completely, you know, not able to figure it out because this input and output is something that we cannot reverse engineer without going into the code, right? Which I'm going to show you another example that we're going to do with the current DARPA project. But, but, but at this stage of my talk, the technology only deals with simple kind of plain text uh, applications. Yes? So some other examples that I could think of of uh, <coughs> really straightforward uh, sensitive data is uh, that I think that you can extend uh, this model to support is, let's say, attachments for uh, emails. Let's say if I save a document, it may be extremely more sensitive than information that I create by yeah. myself. Yeah. And another type of something that sounds to me very sensitive is um, all the authentication things like cookies. So let's say that if you know that you are now in the context, you, you already said that you have some kind of application specific uh, knowledge. And if you know the context that you're at, so let's say a cookie that is created now by uh, Gmail, so now you know that you have to protect this as well because it gains access uh, from remotely from to your, uh, so you can extend the notion of sensitive data, again, using this context and the... Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I agree. I mean, we are not just limiting to network output. We can definitely do fire IO, the same idea. So, but could you go back? Um, yeah. so does this mean that your, whenever the original application was the output, yeah. it changes its underlying um, visual format or the yeah. name of the mm -hmm. first part, uh -huh. you have to update your application as well? Yeah, in, in the in general case, that's true. But, but suppose they only move around the layout, it doesn't really matter. Because we can always search the, the uh, GUI tree with the name of the element. Now, if you change the name of the element, I don't know why. For example, the send button, even though the visual display may not call send, I, I don't know why they would call something else, right? So we haven't encountered many uh, cases like that. So now if you introduce a new GUI element, that typically means that actually, if you think about all the applications, several observations. One is that they actually spend an enormous amount of time studying the GUI. I mean, I used to work as a software engineer. The, one of the reasons I quit was we spent so much time talking about GUI. Spanish. Seriously, like how many pixels we should put on the bottom saying, give me a break. <laughs> how thick, how 3D it should look like. But anyway, all these are actually very important for, for people deciding to buy it, right? And then the things, once, once they decide on a, on a GUI, they don't want to change it so easily. Because typically that means changing the workflow. So there's one observation. Second observation is that 
many applications, they look very similar. Like think about texting. We're actually going to show you a video uh, demo at the end. Like think about what, uh, all these different chat programs. They look e enormously similar. So also that basically is a, is a natural tendency of the user's workflow. Uh, and also, also it's good news to us means that once you figure out how to do it, how to do this with one application, the next one is very, very easy, even in the same category. Or both. Because uh, if the application encrypts the data, then there is no way to monitor payload. Well, if it's depends on whether you encrypt. <coughs> if you encrypt within the application, yes, that's correct. Yeah. So I would consider encryption as not straightforward plain text. In, in fact, the encryption process you can think about as continuing complete, complete kind of process. Anyway, uh, I'm going to skip some of the details of the evaluation. You know, just say. Oh, how I, so, so basically, let's say, let's say take the email example, right? At the moment that user hits send, we know that user wants to send this content out, right? But the content's already, uh, we already have a security overlay display that has that content. And we guarantee that, we guarantee that our display is on top, so we know the user is agreeing with the contents that we have captured. Then when the packet goes out, we actually process the payload and try to match that. Modular the metadata that we have to consider for the application. I mean, are there things you can and can't capture? Like, like, and, I mean, you like done some tests to see if they are both positive and positive. Oh, yeah. So, so we did that. We did all, all of that. Uh, so, so that's what we're talking about here, that you know, false positive, we haven't seen, seen any. Now, there's a, for example, if you have a message that actually a couple of screen long, like, then we have a problem, right? So basically right now it's just limitation that we only capture the current screen, right? So, um, so there's some limitation, right? But, but let's say for email, you know, uh, you can even compare the, 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 uh, the uh, recipient's address and so on, and we can have, we can have applications, application specific logic to look at your address book and compare and so on, so. Um, I think the main limitation actually is on applications that don't do straight uh, plain text processing. Like I said, Microsoft Excel would be one extreme example where you input a formula. Okay, how do you know the, com the result is actually computed correctly? You have no, no way of no knowing. So that's that was one extreme case. But otherwise, most of the applications like email, I think we're editing, we, we do fine. Right, I don't, I mean, I, I'm a yeah, little I puzzled with your definition of intrusion earlier as well, because like obviously you depicted the user saying they don't want the security people to feel kind of intruded upon. Right. So now you just kind of take over their whole interaction with the system, which I think is very intrusive. Just because okay. they don't notice it doesn't mean yeah. that they're not intruded upon their privacy and security. Yes. Now you're collecting all of their data, right? But anyway, yeah, yeah, like yeah, two yeah, well, levels of intrusion so, yeah, so I think we collect all of data same way as the application collects all of, the, all, all of their data. So this is another application that the user owns, I, I, there right? There are emails that are drafts that will be never sent, which is really good for the world that they will not be sent. Mm. <laughs> no, 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 but, but, but we don't send, no, but, but remember, we don't send until the user hits send, right? So my point is that we are not doing anything extra or we are not intruding anything more than the original application. We're capturing, oh, we're, we're capturing the information. I, I, exactly, the exactly. So, right. so we're capturing it in the same way that your, 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 your Gmail is saving the draft. Same way. Your Gmail actually captures it. Yep. Your Outlook also, also saves it in uh, some kind of temporary folder. Same way. We're not doing anything extra. You see? Yes, but the point is that why should I accept, why should I allow another <laughs> application I mean, because, okay, if, so you're saying that, okay, there is an application on my computer that I guess m it might be malicious in the future, then why should, I, why should I allow another application to access that information? Because that application can be also malicious in the future. It could so be. I mean, your antivirus software can also be malicious. Do you want it or not? Right, so my point is we are not doing anything extra or more intrusive than the original application. 
and we have secure application. So you can either trust not to trust the secure application or else. I mean, I, I just don't, don't see why we're doing anything more evil than the original Microsoft Word. <laughs> uh, I mean, the Microsoft Word captures everything. Your, your Outlook captures everything when you hit send and says it in the, in the folder. We're doing exactly the same thing. I think anything, nothing more. I see your argument, but I'm yeah. to get a more holistic view. Yeah. Yeah. And now you're basically like in Princeton University's head. So now you have a complete overview of all the applications. Like yeah. And you actually know my boss, right? Like so, there's a bit of an issue here. <laughs> no, no, no. Like so, so again, I'm very saying that. Than what I, and yeah. I could be using Google for very personal communications. And yes. I think that's separated from my Princeton activities. But now you've actually created an application that just meshes all of them, right? Uh, but potentially, I mean, yes. But 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 things that. Our application stays in your machine; doesn't go out. Doesn't doesn't it, it, it doesn't it, the data that we collect only stays local, right? We only send our email that you want to send. So there's right? no there's no cloud-based component. No, it's entirely using the original program to actually send it. It's just, or is it? Am so, I misunderstanding the layer? So so the. So we are we actually not doing the actual sending. Sending still through the app, original application. We're only doing the intercepting and checking to make sure it's it matching. The user intent. But that's all. We do locally, <laughs> yes. But the application, but your applications are offline, I guess. It's no. Just, it's just like doing. The, it's just like a checksum no. before you send. We, it's we, it's we staying, it's staying local. Yeah. I mean, I would still say there might be an issue. Yeah, I mean, it's not because connected it's a second really. point at which packers can try to enter. It's like you'd be working on your. So they probably, probably they would have more trouble with that than going to Microsoft. Yeah, we are not. <laughs> yeah. So we are we are basically local, right? So basically, okay, this yeah, this is nothing to do with. We send a copy to the cloud and then crunch it. No, we don't. Do, we're not doing that. But I still would recommend doing a study with users where you tell them. Yeah. You show your stuff. You do it, and then you ask them like, "We just did this. How do you feel about this?" Um, and also like see what kind of reactions they give to say this looks like a like a dodgy email. Did you send it? Did you give them that, that kind of feedback? Right. What they feel about these things in both positive and both negative in a subjective way. I think would be very helpful to strengthen your point that this is actually something that we want. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering, is, is the application level logic intelligent enough that you could just store hashes of the data that was, would be allowed rather than the data itself? Hash of data. That's an interesting idea. Uh, that would seem to kind of reduce at least some of the privacy concerns of storing all of the data locally. Oh, the problem with that is, yeah. You still have to examine the payload and take out the metadata. You cannot just hash the payload. So you, you have to look at the content anyway. So there's, yeah. there's no way around it. I mean, I think storing probably, you can make an argument you store the hash only. But, but again, we're storing it the same way as your Microsoft Outlook storing a local copy. So we're not doing anything more. But so I mean, my, of course, our application can be compromised the same way as Microsoft. But hey, we have equal chance. <coughs> So we're not increasing the chance, actually. But I mean, is there any other <laughs> application than emails? Yeah, so let's say Word. You know, we've, we've done Word. Um, I mean, we have the PayPal example. Anything. Yeah, save. You can save the file. Same thing. We basically, make sure that you save the same oh. content that user agrees. It's the same idea, actually. Yeah. OK, so um, at this, we have only have a couple minutes left, right? So let me, let me skip my DARPA project because only beginning. So let me just show it. Uh, well, you want to see the DARPA project instead? Is that something cool? I, I'll, I'll show you offline. But but we actually then we extend the uh, we send the overlay idea to mobile. So basically we say, hey, I mean this actually probably will be more uh, <laughs> more to your nerve to say, oh now you can yeah for 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 this one actually we can mesh we can actually have the overlay on top of your whole Android device. We can actually check exactly what app you're doing, which contact you are, you are, you are connecting to, and so on, which is great for parent thing control, but we couldn't sell that. Well, I don't know why. But anyway, so let me just show you an uh, uh, example of uh, using overlay for uh, chatting, which is very, very obvious, right? So be because, like I said, the overlay is a separate window. Uh, so here's an example, right? So on the left, you see, again, we try to claim that we're not going to intrude on the user's GUI or uh, workflow and experience, right? So, for example, you say use WhatsApp, uh, use 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 uh, WhatsApp. The downside is that the data is not encrypted, right? WhatsApp server has a copy, 
You say, I'm going to use Snapchat. Well, OK, you, trust, you want to trust Snapchat, that's fine. But, but our goal is to say, can we do end-to-end -end encryption automatically? The encryption happens on your device. On the sending end and receiving end, receiving end. so now we don't have to trust the s cloud providers encrypting our data. OK, so that's, that's the goal. How, how do we do this? We actually we have this overlay. So what you see as a user, what you see is on the left-hand side, which is the same thing as you are seeing in WhatsApp. But behind the scene, there are actually two different apps. One is our secure overlay app that respond, is responsible for displaying what you're typing okay, in clear text and what you're receiving in clear, in clear text. But behind the scene, suppose you are entering your message. It's going to encrypt your data first. We intercept it, encrypt data first, and then give the encrypted data to the, to the app. So what's app as an app or service? Only gets the encrypted data. On the receiving end, if your friend run, runs the same thing, it will just automatically decrypt and display to you. So you as a user, encryption happens behind the scene. Now you can decide whether this is intrusive or not. Well, I mean, so we actually did some user study, right? People who's, who don't like it say, I don't care. OK, those are hopeless uh, people, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, but for people who do care about privacy, actually say, great. I don't want to do anything. I mean, it's like encryption happen, happens on the fly. And I don't want to change my workflow. So that's, that's the, uh, that's the um, so let me just show you a demo, then I can open up the floor. So we actually implemented this uh, on Android. And uh, so we have this thing on and off. You can move it around. Um, now it's off. Then we can turn it on. <laughs> And uh, and then uh, and then we're going to bring up WhatsApp. Okay, so the student. Uh, so so as you see right now, although it's on, you can see the clear text. But when it's going to turn off, you're going to see actually only the garbled text. So what you see again, when you say off, our app goes away. So you see an original app, and you see the garbled text. But when we turn on our app overlays on top so you see the clear text. That's the idea. And then he's going to start, start chatting. And uh, so it's keep showing off the same thing. And um, so when we start chatting, we do the DP Hellman key exchange. Now, of course, there's a problem with DP Hellman now. We recognize that. So we're working on the public key uh, based stuff. But, but basically, we do a key exchange to establish session key for the session. OK? Um, and then after that, we can start chatting uh, using that key. So, so as you can see, whenever so basically seeing that now, if you turn it off, everything is garbled, right? And only you can only see clear, clear text when our overlay is on. So, which again tells you that whenever we start communicate, WhatsApp as a service only gets complete garbage. Um, then, then the use of basically, you know, you, you can chat like like you normally do. Uh, so you actually, you, as a user, you don't see anything that's different, although behind the scene, everything's encrypted. Um, so we're going to show the, we're going to turn off and then show you the include text. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Um, so you can scroll up and down, no problem. Um, so again, when you turn off, again, this confirms that WhatsApp doesn't get your plain text. Is that important? It's up to you to decide. <laughs> Again, we just kind of, for the users who care, we want to provide a service. And then, um, and then we're going to show that if you talk again, let's say you, you do another round of uh, messaging. Again, your policy can be, hey, each time you talk, you exchange a new key. When you get a new key, your old key will just be forgotten by our app. So in a sense, then the original message cannot be decrypted anymore. So, so that's really better than Snapchat, really. Because even NSA say, give me the key. I said, I can't, because it's DPM and key, and it's, it's already lost. Right? So they really, I mean, they cannot go back to sort of decrypt your old message, because key's, key's gone. Right? So that's, that's a kind of, yes? Can the user read the old messages? No, you can't. You can't? Okay. Yeah. <coughs> But that's better than Snapchat, right? You, because because this, this cryptographically guaranteed, whereas Snapchat, well, you hope 
they do the right thing in the server to delete your data. Good luck with that, right? Uh, now, of course, you can set a policy to say you never expire your key. That's your choice, too. Uh, yeah. Why would you want to use this as opposed to an app which kind of has built-in support for end end encryption? That's great if you trust the app. Right? So our model is that... Exactly. So, so <laughs> but hey, I'm a good guy. No, no, so, so, so no, 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 the point is that this actually, we can actually use the same service for multiple different apps. So we can use WhatsApp, we can use WeChat for people from Asia, and like I said, many chat programs, they have very, very similar. So we can basically use the same service, you know, same generic solution for many different apps, not just relying on, oh, I want this app to turn on their encryption. Well, you can, you can wait, right? But, but, but suppose we do this as a service, say, you can tell us, hey, I really want to use this app, there's a lot of following. We can actually just put in some effort and make it work for that app. Now you have it. And, and you don't rely on the, on, the, on the developer. You can just do it. Uh, yeah. This sounds like something really useful I would download. But, but you know, I don't speak Cantonese. Have you talked to, are you talking to like Apple or something that would just? Yeah, we talked to them. Uh, we didn't talk to Apple. We talked to Google. Google actually got really excited. And it, it turns out that they have a group. It's <laughs> called uh, Social Security Privacy. They were all over it. I'm thinking, wow. Uh, and then they, stick, they want, to, uh, want, us to, want to help us to connect to Apple. And but I want to iron out certain things. So we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, yeah OK. Because yeah. I'm, I'm just wondering if that introduces that would you still trust it if you had given away your code base to somebody else? Would, 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 I'm sorry, would I? What? Would you still trust the thing you've developed if you gave your code base away to someone else? And then people kind of uh, hack, plan back to us. Oh, I don't know. Um, yeah, I have mixed feelings about open source stuff. but. Um, <laughs> But I, I, I can actually see where Google and Apple's uh, attitude really is. They want to, I, I think they generally want to put, uh, provide data privacy to, yeah, to, cut, to, really to consumers. They, they didn't yeah, to but they, they yeah. yeah. And, and so that, that, that's, that, I think that's why this Google's, uh, they have a group called Social uh, uh, Security Privacy. But they also don't want to bear all the burdens because NSA can come after them and so on. I think this kind of solution actually is good because it's a third party is on your device, and Apple can, uh, Apple, Gmail say, hey, I have nothing to do with it. They choose to send data encrypted. Great. Yeah. So does this overlay for chat apps, does it detect uh, whether the other side is also using the overlay? Uh, like if they're not using it, it won't try to set up a session, or will it still like send all these kind of metadata messages trying to negotiate something? Go, oh, wait, no, they don't have it. Never mind. Yeah, yeah. So, so those are engineering details. I'm meaning that if you want to lower it out as a real product, I, I we send it out, and then we negotiate. This, the other side does not have it. Then we're going to give them a link to download, whatever, right? So, I mean, all these things need to be worked out, but that's beyond research. Uh, let me think of can order uh, you first. Yeah. Go um, ahead. So, we did a study with a tool called Scramble, which yeah. like allows you to have a plugin on your browser and Scramble and basically encrypt right. all of your messages. Right. Um, the user study showed that people don't like the idea of trusting a new third party, especially if it's just one they don't know. Right. It's small and right. it's like a university and doesn't have all the like flashy logos. Yeah. Um, and they also, uh, it was very hard to convince them that this application was not collecting their data. Because right. all applications collect their data, so why right. wouldn't this one? Yeah. Um, I'm happy to share the results. It was done yeah. with CMU together. Okay. Um, that study needs to be done again. I think, um, like what you said about Snapchat, like I think people have learned, like most services tell you, you will be able to have access to your data forever, right? Because mm -hmm. like, yeah. they've taught this sort of temporality to the users, yeah. and people expect that service. And Snapchat, thank goodness, they undid this for us, right? <laughs> right. Um, so now you can actually tell people, look, like past communication is gone, and they're like, oh, that's like Snapchat. So th that I think like you caught on to something very interesting there. Yeah, so. yeah. So uh, I think, yeah. I mean, again, we are not. This is not a service. This is an app, right? right. It's, there's no cloud. We, we don't have anything in the cloud. Uh, yeah. uh, have you considered what? Oh, sorry. I mean, I don't know. I lost the order. Who's next? <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Uh, so I should back say, there. like, people, if they have to leave for class and stuff like that, yeah. um, uh, they should feel free to do that. But we can continue. Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. So, so. And yeah, let's, let's thank. thank okay. You. All right. yeah. All right. Thank you.